This is the White Coat Investor Podcast, Milestones to Millionaire, celebrating stories of success along the journey to financial freedom. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Milestones to Millionaire. This is episode number 98. We're here to tell the story of Eli, who brought a product to market. And this is going to be a little bit of a different podcast than you're used to, but I think there's a lot to learn here. So let's dive in. This podcast is brought to you by MLG Capital. Over the last 35 years, MLG Capital has focused on making smart investments in real estate and building relationships with their investors. With their investor-centric fund structures, accredited investors can invest their money with confidence in funds that target diversification, prioritize cash flow, and low leverage with a unique dual sourcing strategy. Unsure about investing due to rising inflation or volatility in the stock markets? Investing in real estate has historically been one of the best hedges against inflation. If you're a medical professional and would like to learn more about investing with MLG, visit whitecoatinvestor.com slash MLG. MLG Capital, smart investments, relationship driven. All right, Eli. Hi, how are you? Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. So as I understand it, um, you have brought eight products to market. You're an entrepreneur. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, Soon to be nine, but yes. (laughs) Wonderful. So you're bringing your ninth product to market next uh, next year, the first quarter of next year. That's correct. So um, tell us about your product a little bit and tell us about how you got into all uh, doing all of this in the first place. So the latest product that uh, I'm bringing to market has been in R&D for five years. And so it's quite exciting to finally deliver it to our customers. And it's called InstaFloss. It's a device that can floss all of your teeth in 10 seconds. And I had the idea for the product when I was eating a bunch of mango with my brother. And we're like, (laughs) there has to be a way to get rid of this, you know, much quicker. Yeah. And by that time, I don't remember how many products we came out with, but, uh, you know, somewhere between four and eight. And, you know, we were already in the consumer technology world, and we had already been building it. So we're thinking about this very mechanically. And so, you know, I started buying dental textbooks. I started reading about the problem. I had ideas. But, you know, of course, I'm more of a mechanical person. So I brought on a dentist and a dental scientist uh, in order to, you know, discuss the science with them and how to validate the idea. And I didn't really know how much I was getting myself into five years ago. But five years of R&D later, uh, we are now just around the corner to deliver to customers. So it's been quite a ride. Oh my goodness. So like regular floss wouldn't do for you. You had to get it done within 10 seconds. Uh, well, it's not just me. It's uh, <laughs> 70% of people regularly skip flossing. And the reason they give is because it takes too long. Yeah. So if you remove the number one obstacle, you can really help uh, people's health. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so that's so cool that you, you know, mangoes, especially, I totally understand your yes. struggle there. <laughs> <laughs> Delicious, but yes, bad for the for the flossing. <laughs> um, so I'm just really okay. So first of all, uh, Eli, you are not a medical professional, right? You are that's an right. entrepreneur. So I'm just really fascinated by how you took this one problem and then you spent five years coming up with all this data and talking to all these experts. How did you, how did you even get there? How did you get started? Like, how did this whole journey start for you? So I got into the consumer technology world uh, well over a decade ago when my, my brother, who's a musician, uh, he had the idea for a drum machine inside a guitar pedal which Mm -hmm. is um something that most most musicians have a hard time finding drummers to play with and -hmm. if you can buy drum machines you need to use your hands you can't use your hands for the drum machine and the guitar at the same time so it's like can we do this hands-free in a way that's not very difficult and intuitive and we came up with sketches and neither of us really had any money but we found a uh, engineering firm that believed in the products because there were a bunch of musicians in the engineering firm. Mm-hmm. And anyone who's a musician would know that 
that was easily going to make money. So they mm -hmm. said, look, we'll take this, uh, you know, with no payment up front, but you need to run a crowdfunding campaign. And when we know you're successful, you'll be able to pay us back. Now, that was a that was a great way to be able to start it. But it also meant that we really had a lot on the line. So we worked very hard on that crowdfunding campaign. And luckily, we broke the record for the largest crowdfunding campaign for a musical tech item wow. uh, ever at the time. So we were able to pay the engineers back. And that's how our first company started. Oh, my God. How much did you raise? We raised 350 and this was in 2013. So the, there have been yeah. companies that have broken our records since then, but at the time we were number one. Amazing. So you just, you brought this, you brought this idea to a bunch of people that could, you know, make it a reality and then mm -hmm. you made it happen. So you and your brother started the first uh, company. Mm -hmm. um, and then where have you gone since then? So we've, we've come up with a number of products and, um, the InstaFloss, though, uh, because it's in a completely different industry, I started a, a new company and I brought on from the beginning, I brought on uh, Dr. Anamas Karanhas, who's the uh, uh, ADA chair of the Council of Science. And so she really advised us on how to um, be sure that this is actually uh, effective. Uh, and and uh, accomplishing what we're supposed to accomplish. So we started in, with our initial prototypes. We actually were flossing uh, uh, pig heads. Uh, we would floss <laughs> the pigs. We would cut away the gums. We would see how much how much plaque we were getting uh, rid of. We would make adjustments to the prototype. Uh, this actually caused a little bit of strife because uh, I started the second company in the office of my first company, and some people who worked there were like, "Why are you flossing pigs in the food <laughs> sink? Do science in the science sink!" And it was just a just a mess. <laughs> um, and then and then the next stage after we got it right, and we're like, "Okay." The, the mechanics work, the device can do what it's supposed to do, and it works on pigs. Now it's time to move into humans. But before we did any, you know, actual approved trials, I wanted to try it myself. Um, and uh, so I started flossing with it and it felt really amazing. But I'm used to flossing for, you know, like two, three minutes, perhaps. And if you do the math, uh, 10 seconds with the Insta Floss is the equivalent of two minutes with uh, another device. So two minutes with the InstaFloss is uh, 120 seconds, which is the equivalent to 24 minutes. If you do it for three minutes, it's 36 minutes. And so I was flossing for half an hour, multiple, the equivalent of half an hour, multiple times a day. Wow. And any dental professional will tell you that that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. And so uh, after like a week of this, I actually started breaking out in sores. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> like on my gums, on my on my like uble on my tongue, everything. Oh my I God. went to uh, a dentist, you know, sort of an emergency, and he's like, "Okay, you got a nog. This is essentially trench mouth. This is what they would get in World War One because you uh, stripped the top layer from your gums and you got infected. So we're going to give you antivirals, antibacterials, antifungals, any domain of life. We're just going to kill." Oh my so, God! <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so that's when you know I realized, like, okay. You know, you don't, there is a big problem that people don't floss enough, but you also want to prevent over flossing. <laughs> and so it's a good thing I did it on myself before we went into human trials, uh, because uh, what we what we added to the device <laughs> from that was after the 10 second floss, it blinks yellow, it stops, it essentially says, cool off, slow down, don't do this again. So you would have to really intentionally uh, do what I did. You can't do it by accident anymore. Uh -huh. uh, and then we went into human trials and then we saw that we were actually more affected than any device uh, currently on the market. And then we spent the last two years uh, working on the molds for manufacturing. And finally, after five years and uh, three and a half million dollars of development costs, <laughs> yeah. we uh, are ready to finally deliver to customers. Wow. So you put your literally your own skin in the game. That is <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty impressive. So I want to know more about like your personal financial journey during all of this. Mm -hmm. So that first um that first product that you made, you said it was uh, you did really well um fundraising mm -hmm. for it. Um right. with the, the drum machine into the uh guitar pedal. Um how did it do on on sale and did that help your personal finances at all? Uh it did. Um however, 
what we what we would do is we would when you're coming out with new products the sort of fixed cost the r d of that uh can be expensive so if we were to just decide let's not develop anything new and let's just take the money from the profits and pocket that then uh then you know i would see some personal fin- immediate financial gain however i think the last 10 years i've definitely been a case study in a person who's rich on paper <laughs> but uh not really taking much of the money for myself because you know i really believe in the the potential of you know expanding uh creating something better making a v2 making a v3 etc so we've been funneling that in but on paper you know, should we ever sell the previous company? And if we were to sell, you know, the Insta Plus at the current valuation, uh, my net worth would be $25 million. But um, frankly, uh, I wouldn't accept that money right now because uh, there's currently $1.2 billion worth of water floss are sold every year. And they take the number one complaint that flossing takes too long and they make it even worse. They make it take even longer. Mm-hmm. So Insta Floss solves that complaint. So I think we can do better than that. And therefore, I think I would be a fool to uh, sell out at the current moments before we actually uh, demonstrate our market share. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Do you pay yourself a salary from the company? I do pay myself a salary, but I only pay myself um, what I need to, uh, you know, live comfortably in the location that that I currently am. So I'm, I'm only, yes. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. So you're paying enough uh, for living. Are you saving for retirement at all? Um, I'm not saving for retirement. I am uh, building value of the corporation for retirement. Oh, okay. So, um, put, that's where all my chips are. So you're investing for retirement in a company, which is uh, both high risk, but really high gain as well. Uh, I would say so, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. So now that you have, have um, so you've developed Instafloss, I saw your website and it's very impressive looking. Um, but uh, so now that you are going to take it to market and sell it, um, well, first of all, tell us about if someone else wanted to do this, they wanted to develop a product and put mm-hmm. it on, on the market. What are the steps that they need to take to get there? Just like you have just done. Right. So if you have a product um, rather than a service, and I could talk a lot more about products and services because that's that's what I've created. I understand that industry <laughs> way better. Yeah. So, you know, let's say I would say the first thing you want to make sure is, does it actually solve a problem? You know, there's nothing worse than a, a than a solution and look of a in search of a problem. It's it's not <laughs> going to it's not going to do anything. Nobody's going to want it. You have to solve a problem. Hmm. If you solve the problem, my next recommendation to you would be to go to uh, go to Google and type in Google patents. And uh, Google has a great patent search function. Now, this is not a professional patent search, but it should be your step one because it's free. And uh, you can see, did anybody else patent this? And just because they have doesn't mean you can't do anything. You might be able to find an innovation. You might be able to work around their patents, or maybe you'll just owe them uh, a licensing fee, you know, depending on the situation. But if they haven't patented it and your idea is patentable, which for that I would contact a lawyer. Uh, once you see, once you've done the search yourself, don't waste money on a lawyer. If you search it up and you find that it's already been patented, mm. um, then I think you're in a much better position because, especially if you haven't done this before and you don't have the capital and you don't have the team and you don't have, you know, the the market position and the and the, the customers, etc. If you don't have a patent, you're probably going to get eaten alive pretty quickly. So I would say it's much safer. And it's also much profitable if you have a patentable idea. So are you solving a problem? Has it been patented before? And if it hasn't been patented before, contact your patent lawyer, see if you could patent it. If you can patent it, now I would start contacting engineering firms, seeing how much it would cost to develop and what the estimated uh, cost of the product would be. Okay, so now you know how much it will cost you to develop, what it might cost. Anything that it might cost you, you want to multiply by at least three. So if it costs you $10 to create, you need to be selling it for at least 30 in order to make money. If you could sell it for more than that, that's better. It gives you room to play with. Mm. Because if you um, are 
selling direct, you probably are going to need to spend a third on marketing. If you're selling to, to stores, you're probably going to need to set, set, uh, spend a third goes to the store, sometimes more depending on the situation if it's a distributor. So anything less than three is very hard to make work. So if you know that your product is going to cost $10 to create and you know that you need to sell it for at least 30, the next bit of research you need to do is will it sell at 30 and how much will it sell at 30? And that's sometimes more of an art than a science because how do you know the answer to something that doesn't exist? So I would look at comparables. So for example, with us, uh, you know, we looked at water pick and we saw how much water pick was being sold for. And we're like, well, if we can come in at the same price as water pick, but we're, but instead of making the number one complaint about flossing worse, we make the number one complaint better. I think that we have a pretty good shot at, uh, you know, cannibalizing some, if not all of those sales. Um, and so you would want to do the similar thing, you know, depending on what your product is. And uh, the more innovative it is, the harder it is to uh, answer that directly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, you'll probably have to start, you know, being a little bit more, uh, uh, be a little bit less certain about, you know, will this price be good? Will the demands be what I think it is? But at the same time, if it's that innovative, perhaps the reward is that much greater. So it could be even more worth it to uh, pursue that idea if there truly is nothing like it. Okay. And how do you know you've hit the, you know, all of these steps? How do you know that you have brought something to market that is valuable to customers? Um, What is the measure of well, of course, the sale, right, uh, of your product. Um, but uh, is there any other measure that you should really um, take into account before you even go to uh, go to market? Uh, if possible, get people's reactions of using it. Um, you know, if if people try it and they're like, "Meh," you know, you're going to have a hard time because I think we undervalue just how important word of mouth is. Um, on Amazon, if you're less than four stars, you're essentially one star. (laughs) So if people don't have like a four plus experience, uh, then, then they're really just having, you know, if you're not making something great, it's, you're, you're really making something that's not, that's not going to sell. So it depends on where you are in the stage. If you can create a prototype and you can try it and you love it and all your friends love it and then random people you give it to who don't have to be nice to you love it. Uh, and, and it solves the problem that you're seeking, right? If you've solved the problem, then it has value. And so I would say, see how well you've solved the problem and how much people like your solution to the problem. Obviously, if you solve the problem, but you create five new ones, uh, that uh, might not be the greatest value proposition. Yeah. So um, do you like sell the product before it even comes to market? Are you able to do that? So that is a great way uh, to require less investment. And we have done that. I've done that pretty much for every product, uh, including Instafloss. So with Instafloss, we've pre-sold 2.5 million direct to consumers, which is one way that we've validated the demand. Wow. We've, we, you know, it, we validated people's experiences long before we even started selling to them, you know, because we would get testers in. If the testers didn't like it, we wouldn't even start to pre-order because then you're just going to get yourself in trouble. If you are selling things to people, things to people that they're not even going to like, uh, that's more of a liability than anything. Sure, you have money right now, but they're going to want to return it. They're going to trash talk you. So step mm-hmm. one, make sure it's good. And then once you know it's good, you can open pre-orders. There's a lot of platforms like Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Uh, and so on. And people will give you money full up front for a discount. And if you're doing that, I'd recommend to really work with it, either a marketer or an agency that really knows what they're doing, because if it's not your expertise, that can really be hard to do. But luckily, it doesn't have to be your expertise. You know, um, in fact, none of this has to be your expertise. Uh, if you have the idea, you can partner every step of the way with people who know more than you and you should. You know, everybody should know more than you every step of the way. The marketers should know more than you about marketing. The engineers should know more than you about engineers. If you need specialists, medical uh, uh, advisors, they should know more than you about the medical advice. And you should listen to people who know more than you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you have a team of people who are smart and competent and your product solves a need, then as long as you don't mess it up, I think you're going to be well on your way to a great success. 
Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for all that vast knowledge. I'm going to ask you a couple of extra questions just about mm-hmm. what you've just said. So you said um, an idea needs to be patentable. What makes an idea patentable? So I don't think an idea needs to be patentable. Mm-hmm. But there are plenty of ideas that can make money that are not patentable. In fact, most of them, most of the things that you see in the store uh, either are not patentable, at least they're no longer patentable because they've expired and they're making plenty of money. I just think that it's harder uh, mm-hmm. to maintain your market share. And especially if this is your first time doing it, if you don't have a patent, you're going to be in a tough position. The big companies are probably going to eat you up. So mm-hmm. I highly recommend that if you're going to be pursuing something, you pursue a patentable idea. And I recommend that you get it patented uh, yeah. with a decent lawyer. Um, what makes a idea patentable is in the words of the law is it's novel and inventive so it has to have uh, never been done before and it has to also provide some kind of utility at least for a utility patent which is the type of patent we're talking about um there's design patents they're not really worth anything don't pursue it because that just means the way it looks is patented but if it looks different, then it's no longer patented. So, so who cares, mm. right? So you want to pursue a utility patent, which means that it provides utility, and that the uh, idea is the way in which it provides utility is novel. So if you if you created a new way of a better mousetrap, that's a, that's a patented idea, patentable idea. <laughs> okay, all right. And uh, so you would go to a lawyer to get that. Uh, get that patent um and and, mm-hmm. and then you would get engineers where do you find these people to hire so um so the internet is the short answer of that <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think i think the hardest question there is is vetting the people that you're looking up right yeah because sure you can find people but how do you know if they're they're if they're any good right and honestly that is also a little bit more of an art than a science um so i would uh, I would get a lot of quotes. Just because someone's more expensive doesn't necessarily mean they're good. Uh, and just because someone says they can do it for cheap doesn't mean they actually can. Mm. So there usually is some sort of middle ground between these two things. Some people will be overpriced and some people will underdeliver. Um, definitely vet them to the best of your ability. If they're an engineering firm, say, what have you made that is like this? Is it on the market? Uh, you know, uh, so if you're making a dental product, have you worked in dental products before? Are they in the market? Can I go to CVS? Can I buy them? Are they good? Can I contact the founders of that company and say, Hey, these manufacturers, the, sorry, these engineers said that they designed this. Did they really, what role did they play? Did they play a helping role or did they, you know, actually hinder your design? You had to hire another firm to, to fix all their mess, you know, mm. which happens more than you would think. People say, I worked on this and technically true. They did work on this, but not in the way that, that you would think. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's kind of an arduous process, but if it's your money, you should be smart with your money. Try not to waste it, you know, yeah. really try to do your homework and try to verify as much as you can. Just because somebody says something doesn't mean it's true or the full truth. So contact, contact, contact as many verifiable third sources as possible. And even then you're going to be taking something on faith, but yeah. at least you're going to be taking it on as little faith as possible. <laughs> so there's no like a website like Fiverr where we can um, hire freelancers. There's no website that has like a, a bunch of these people listed. Is there? Um, well, so so I found people for smaller and less important projects mm-hmm. on something like uh, Upwork, for example. Okay. Uh, and, th- and there's a million sites like this. So, for example, I needed uh, uh, some 3D renders done because I wanted to show investors what it will look like. Hey, give me some money and we're going to create this and this is it's all sexy. And so I went to Upwork and, you know, I didn't really need to verify so much because they have a portfolio. And they're like, look, I did some 3D renders. But for mm-hmm. engineers... Um, you can find engineers via Upwork as well, and they have reviews, and it could be good. And, and honestly, for industrial design, I found some great people. But in terms of a more long-term, thorough project, I've really tried to look up firms and verify their work. I'm not saying you can't do it via Upwork or any of the competitors. Mm-hmm. Uh, just it might not necessarily be, be your best route for that specifically. Okay. 
Thank you. That's all uh, knowledge that, you know, um, uh, us uh, medical professionals uh, following a very prescriptive path uh, Mm -hmm. to our, um, you know, employment. um, That's stuff that we don't learn. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners will be interested in that process. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, Um, I I just want to say that as medical professionals, you know what you need, you know what the what the what the patient needs. And so you're really in a prime position to come up with something patentable because you have knowledge and experience that very few people have as a percentage of the population. So if there's anybody who could come up with something and then realize that no one else has come up with this particular idea before, it's very likely a medical professional. Yeah. Um, And do you have any sort of like consulting roles available? Um, uh, Is that a thing? So... I don't have any consulting roles available, but I am happy to answer any questions. Uh, if you email me at eli at instafloss.com, uh, I won't charge you. Uh, the worst I'll do is say, look, I'm not spending my time on this. <laughs> but, but no, uh, like I think it's much more valuable for me to, to work on, on, on bringing Instafloss and our other products to market. But that being said, um, I want to see what other people come up with, and I want the world to have more cool things that solve solve more problems. So I'm happy to to answer emails. I'm happy to point you in the right direction. I'm happy to recommend engineers if I believe they're a good fit for you. I'm happy to recommend lawyers if I believe they're a good fit for you. The world is round, so I'm sure it will come back. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I won't I won't charge for that. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so what? Uh, what is your next step now? Now that you're going to take it to market, what's the what's in the future for you? So uh, we have, I would say, uh, a few different vectors. So one is getting it, we get it to market and we deliver to the people who've pre-ordered, but then we have to get it on every bathroom counter. So <laughs> for that, we have to go through e-commerce, we have to work on Amazon, we have to work on marketing, we have to get into stores, as well as uh, dental practices. Uh, we're going to have an educational arm to uh, educate uh, dental practitioners on the our five years of research. We've put a lot of work into the Instafloss, and um, we want them to know the science behind our product. And we want to uh, we want them to be aware. So when their patients uh, ask them the question, they don't just say, "Well, I don't know. Sounds too good to be true." Uh, just, just probably not. Uh, <laughs> so we we want to have that conversation, and so we need to develop the team to educate. Uh, in addition, we have more products that we're coming out with uh, that are going to be complementary, and we have to start developing that. And uh, there's a lot of scaling we need to do on the manufacturing side. So that is going to be uh, where I'm going to spend a lot of my time personally, uh, mm-hmm. is making sure that we can produce enough units to meet demand. Right. Wonderful. Well, I hope that does become a par- problem for you is to keep up with demand. What's <laughs> <laughs> what's one thing um, if you wanted if you were going to talk to another entrepreneur? What's mm-hmm. one thing that you would tell them? Uh, one piece of advice that would be the key to your success. One key uh, key to success, I would say, is be able to find, talk to and uh take the advice from people who know much more than you mm-hmm. uh and at the same time really try to understand their work so when the the lawyers the patent lawyers send you the work they've done you could just be like i don't understand any of this i'll just take your advice point blank no really try to understand it try to learn from everyone because them because you have an idea this is your baby and you need to see it th- you need to see it through and in order to do that you need to understand the advice that's being given to you by people who've spent decades learning more than you so really try to understand as much as possible for everything that's going on in your business because it will only help you if you don't understand the marketing if you don't understand the engineering if you don't understand the legal you're probably going to make bigger mistakes than you otherwise would have made mm. uh, that that would have been avoidable. I'm not saying you have to be the most competent person. In fact, you shouldn't. Your lawyer should be better than you. <laughs> you know, yeah. your engineer should be better than you and your marketer should be better than you. But you should try your hardest to learn as much as possible of their um, their professions and their expertise, because otherwise you're wasting their time talking to them. And, you know, you might as well just say, hey, look, run this without me and I'm just going to take it on faith because you're also going to need to realize 
went to fire somebody. You will encounter people who are not the best fit for you or your business. They're not necessarily as competent as you thought they were. And the more competent you make yourself, the sooner you're going to realize that. I love that humility. And I, and I love that perspective of, you know, work with people that know more than you and, and learn from them. Um, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. And I wish you all the best um, and your new product launch. And um, thank you again. And, uh, and uh, have a great day. And thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Okay, so that was a much different Milestones to Millionaire than you, we're used to hearing. I was really interested in how Eli was going to was going to develop his product. And now that he's taking that to market, um, he shared several different insights with us that I thought were very interesting. First thing he said was, understand how big of a need there is for your product first before you go forward. And make sure you can patent it because without a patent, um, it's difficult to be successful. Then research the IP framework before anything else and uh, learn manufacturing fundamentals to see if you can create a product in the target price range. So you want to get, you know, there's a lot of R&D. There's, there's a lot of time um, spent on this product before it even came to market. And uh, getting a little bit of an insight into how that's done can be really valuable to white coat investors. Uh, because like he said, you know, we do have a lot of knowledge um, and a lot of personal experience that we can apply to create products that are actually uh, needed in the space. So I hope you found that podcast helpful. And if you want to learn more about Eli, he's at instafloss.com. This episode was sponsored by MLG Capital. MLG, MLG Capital is a proven real estate ma manager with a 35-year track record of delivering attractive, risk-adjusted returns to their investors. Their acquisition strategy mitigates risk through diversification, utilizing moderate leverage and offering investors prioritized cash flow. They believe that they have the right deal sourcing strategy in place to continue to find unique opportunities regardless of the market cycle. Real estate is a great asset class to help investors diversify out of the public markets and can be especially powerful in this inflationary environment. Additionally, for highly compensated individuals, real estate investing can provide tax-sheltered income. If you'd like to learn more about MLG, visit whitecoatinvestor.com slash MLG. Thank you for listening today. Keep your head up, shoulders back. You've got this, and we can help at The White Coat Investor. The hosts of the White Coat Investor podcast are not licensed accountants, attorneys, or financial advisors. This podcast is free entertainment and information only. It should not be considered professional or personalized financial advice. You should consult the appropriate professional for specific advice relating to your situation. 